It is now my privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Cheryl served for almost 10 years of active duty service in the US Navy, first as a helicopter pilot, then as a Russia policy officer. Following her naval career, Cheryl then entered law where she worked for the US Attorney's Office in New Jersey. She now represents New Jersey's 11th Congressional District in the US House of Representatives and has been a stalwart champion of diplomacy first foreign policy during this her first term. Congresswoman, we look forward to what you have to share. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for hosting this really important discussion. I was on a Foreign Policy for America call last night and got to briefly chat with you and, and tell you how much I was looking forward to the event, and it's great to be here today. And, and thank you, Erin, for that really powerful opening. Um, I, too, love America, and I also agree. Those of us who deeply love this country feel compelled to constantly work to make her better and to ensure that everyone in this diverse nation can enjoy the promises of our nation at her best. I'm always happy to talk about issues facing military families, but I'm especially glad to be talking about them with the Secure Families Initiative. I think the way our defense and foreign policies impact families is too often overlooked, and our families have too few people sitting at the table to advocate. Our country rightly celebrates and honors the sacrifices the men and women of our armed services make for our country. But our military families face difficult sacrifices too. Spouses and children, I, I know you all know this, often get thanked at change of command ceremonies uh, or retirements. But too many times they aren't in the room when issues of op tempo or deployments or war are being discussed. It's so important for your voices to be heard. And, and I, I was side texting someone on my team about you know, what a great perspective Aaron was bringing to these issues, especially now because our country is grappling with so many challenges. This Congress, which includes the diverse, and, and, and I know you guys aren't going to think this, but by congressional standards, young class of 2019 has wrestled with some historic issues. We were the first class ever to enter in the middle of a government shutdown. We've conducted oversight, fought to lower the cost of prescription drugs, protected America's open spaces and led during the COVID-19 pandemic. During this historic two-year period, I think we've made some important strides on issues related to military families and veterans, and that is in no small part due to the focus of our veterans in Congress. For example, the National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year of 2020 included crucial reforms to the military housing system. It's probably the last group I need to point this out to, but on-base privatized housing has been in need of urgent upgrades for years. And service members and their families have needed more leverage, better housing options, and stronger voices in the military's housing decisions. The FY 2020 NDAA made huge progress in that regard, including millions in funding to fight hazards like mold, asbestos, and lead paint in military housing. None of that progress would have been made without military families advocating for themselves and their loved ones. The FY 2020 NDAA always re also repealed the Survivor Benefit Plan, Dependency and Indemnity Compensation Offset, which will put more money in the hands of the loved ones of our service members. These survivors, many of them Gold Star families, deserve every benefit we can give them. It is unconscionable that it took Congress so long to repeal what we've called the widow's tax, but I was proud to support the efforts that led to its repeal. The necessity of that repeal was made real to so many members of Congress simply because of the stories they heard from military families across the country. The work of supporting military families and veterans is far from finished. Military families face challenges ranging from paid family leave to child care to professional certifications for spouses. When I was in the Navy, military spouses were often too far down the list of priorities. As we all know, military life requires frequent moves often in places where military families have no connections, no outside community, and few job options. Professional certifications are a key example here. A military spouse, spouse with a law degree could pass the bar and say Washington State, as a friend of mine did. She, her husband was stationed at Whidbey Island. She worked hard through law school, passed the bar only to move to Norfolk and, and have no ability to practice. I became an attorney after I left the Navy, and let me tell you, the bar exam is not an experience I'm eager to repeat. So it's a high bar to get through. 
We see this issue apply across the board, nurses, teachers, doctors. After each move, new certifications are needed, new expenses are incurred, and more time is invested. For many jobs, this comes with less job security, less seniority, and fewer benefits. For military families with children, this stress is amplified by arranging schools, child care, and dealing with the adjustment for children living in a new and strange place. Both Congress and the military itself have taken steps to address this problem, including by enacting the Portable Certification of Spouses Act in the FY 2020 NDAA. But we have to do more. Our culture has moved forward in many families. Both parents are working. In some, both parents are serving in active duty roles. Removing any hurdles they face in pursuing active employment is the very least we can do. But even if we removed all of those professional hurdles, every parent's first concern is for their children. As we all know, military jobs are demanding and time consuming. Service members and their families deserve to know that their child is safe, educated, and cared for. And I loved Aaron's description of why it's so critical that we support good education across this country. I know that my good friend, Chrissy Houlihan, who serves with me in the house, chose to separate from the Air Force because of a lack of affordable and accessible childcare. The on-base care where she served had a long wait list. This forced parents to go to the open marketplace, which was often far too expensive for those on a military salary. On-base child development centers are extremely valuable resources for military families and must be fully funded and staffed. I was outraged when this administration chose to reprogram money from the CDCs and military schools to pay for its border. On the Armed Services Committee, I've advocated for restrictions on that type of reprogramming action, and I will keep fighting to ensure that the well-being of the children of our military is not put at risk due to fund unnecessarily political, unnecessary political maneuvers. I'm also deeply concerned with threats to the military health care system. TRICARE and the VA are both struggling to find doctors, and families without access to a nearby military treatment facility are seeing their costs increase. Adding insult to injury, the Defense Department was, until very recently, considering a $2.2 billion cut to the military health system without adequately explaining how they were going to care for families. While that cut was defeated, the fact that it was considered at all, especially during a pandemic, is surprising to me. Service members and their families should be able to rely on readily available, comprehensive health care, whether they live on a base or in a remote rural area. I've always fought for robust military health care, and I'll continue to do just that. I don't want to sound like there hasn't been progress. There has. I'm extremely proud of NDAA for fiscal year 2021. This year's bill included several important provisions uh, for service members and their families. It authorizes $40 million for impact aid to educational agencies that serve military dependent students. It sets in motion a study on the feasibility of allowing military spouses to make thrift savings plan contributions and authorizes a pay increase for service members. All these provisions were made better and stronger by the voices of military spouses themselves. When I came to Congress, I co-founded the Service Women and Women Veterans Caucus with the three other female veterans in the House, Chrissy Houlihan, Elaine Luria, and Tulsi Gabbard. Our caucus works to address problems facing the largest growing segment of both the military and veteran communities, women, looking at everything from military sexual assault to access to quality and affordable health care. We formed the caucus because we knew that service women and women veterans needed to have their stories told in Congress. And one of the things our caucus pushed for this session was making sure that TRICARE covered 3D mammograms, the standard of care when it comes to breast cancer screenings. In December of 2019, TRICARE announced that policy change. I'm also very proud of the Four Country Caucus, a bipartisan group of veterans in the House who've come together, regardless of party ties, to advance legislation that works for the good of our service members, their families, and our national defense. I say all of that to say this, your advocacy is needed. Your voices are needed. All of the progress this Congress has made would not have been possible without military families themselves speaking up, demanding to be heard, and providing their insight and experiences. Most members of Congress haven't served in the military. Many members haven't had a loved one served in the military. We need to hear from you. The veterans and active duty service members and families who I hear from in the 11th district make me a better representative and ensure that I'm focused on the issues happening on the ground. I know all of the changes I've outlined today are well known to you, so think of this as a call to action. Call your members of Congress, tell your friends and families to call there, share your stories, write letters, and we can continue to make progress. Thank you again for having me here today. It's really been an honor.
Thank you so much. And I can't imagine a more uplifting call to action than just that, hearing directly from a great leader like yourself about how we can be most effective. So thank you so much. Um, if I may, can I ask one follow-up question, if that's all right, oh, and then we'll, we'll let you get off to more important things. But I am curious, since the theme of our event today is, you know, going past the kind of um, surface level understanding of, of what a veteran and military family life looks like. I'm curious if you wouldn't mind just briefly reflecting on how your service experience as a veteran has shaped your priorities uh, as a congresswoman. I know you've, you've laid out a lot of the things you've worked on, um, but maybe just one comment on how that's kind of informed your decision making. Well, I wouldn't underestimate expressing to people outside of the military what the basic level, what it basically looks like, uh, not just for service members, but for family members, because we just have so few people in this country who serve, and so many of us in service have done so uh, because, you know, we have a parent or a relative in service, so we become, um, what, what we're afraid of becoming is this warrior class that's apart from society, and that's not just bad for society, it's bad for the military. We need those connections. Um, and so I think it is important for all of you to tell your stories. Uh, you know, when we're, we, we talk a lot about veterans and I would even say, uh, or military members, and I would even say so many in Congress need to better understand what that life is like. But I mean, we don't talk nearly enough about what it's like for the family members and what it means to be a family member of someone serving. And I think what's compelling, you know, what compels myself and Chrissy Houlihan and Elaine Lurie, we have served and we have children. Uh, Elaine served with a child. Um, Chrissy and I had gotten out. Chrissy got out because she had children and because it's so difficult. And I think that compels us to act in this area. Uh, believe me, um, as a husband who works uh, or having a husband who works, it's hard enough balancing our jobs without having to move when he said, okay, I got new orders, you know, and to then say, oh my, how am I going to continue my career? Um, so, so these are all really critically important things to express and discuss. And again, personal stories mean so much, I think, to legislators. But I would also say, kind of to your point, it's critical, I think, to have the, the way my service, the way my experience uh, impacts my, my time in Congress and my thinking about Congress. I know people who have PTSD. I, I know people who have lost so much um, by going to war that I don't take war lightly. I, I, I'm concerned that we're in, you know, what some of us call these forever wars, that, that people's parents served in the same war that they're serving in now. Um, I do think it's critical that we look at how we are going to safely get out of Afghanistan, get out of Iraq, but leave those countries stable and secure. Um, we can't simply pull right out, but we also need to have a path towards that. So, so these are critical issues. And, and, and I think of these because I know the impact these wars have. It's not theoretical. It's not just some testimony I've seen in Congress. It's close and personal friends who've experienced it. And I think that's why it's so critical to have people that are familiar with the military serving in Congress. Um, I think it's too easy to be outside the military to have never served or to never have a child at war and to just send other people's children to war. And, and that is something that um, greatly concerns me. When I was born in 1972, we had 70% of Congress had served and right now it's under 20%. So, um, so that really does critically inform my, you know, my th thought process and I think other veterans in Congress now. But thanks again, Sarah. I, I really I really do appreciate it. I think this is such an important discussion. And, and so thanks for letting me be a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you for your generosity of time and input. Oh, thank we you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thanks.